Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. How did the building blocks of life emerge on Earth? This episode, I got the chance to speak to Haisa Martins about her research into the meteorites that delivered the ingredients for life to take hold. Uh, my name is Haisa Machings. I'm currently a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge, and I study nucleosynthetic anomalies in meteorites and try to understand how they contributed to Earth's formation. Thanks very much for, for speaking to me today. It's great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me. The reason our paths have crossed is because of one of your more recent studies, which is looking into how the building blocks of life emerged on Earth, which is, you know, obviously fascinating stuff. And I always find that invariably when this sort of research is done, we're always looking at meteorites. So we wanted to start off by asking you, why are meteorites so important in, in the story of, of Earth and life? Yeah, so meteorites are some of the oldest materials that we have in the solar system in the sense that they haven't, a lot of them haven't been modified since four and a half billion years ago. So they give us an idea of what kind of material was available before Earth and other planets formed. So does that mean that when you when you conduct a study like this, you're actually going into the lab and, and analyzing meteorite samples? Yeah, so we start off with selecting the meteorites and applying to get them from different organizations, usually museums or like NASA. A lot of meteorites come from Antarctica when they're previously classified, usually. So we know which types of meteorites we're looking for and that would be useful for our study. So that would be the first step. And then once we get the meteorites, I will take them into the lab, crush them using a mortar and pestle into the finest powder that I can possibly achieve. Then we'll put them in different acids to try to get all the ions that were in the rocks into solution so we can then analyze their composition, either the elemental abundances or the isotope compositions and see what that tells us. Amazing. I mean, it must be so exciting because I, I suppose you're you're essentially looking back millions, billions of years in time, aren't you, when, when you're doing something like this? Yeah. The oldest meteorites we have are four and a half billion years old. So they have some of the first materials that ever formed in our solar system and they, they're preserved. They, they still have the same constitution of some of these components is still the same that they were four and a half billion years ago, essentially. So it's like looking into the very first of steps of forming a planetary system. How much do we actually know about Earth's formation? Do we have the full story of how a planet like Earth was formed? There's some debate about some of the processes, but generally we think it starts off with very small materials like dust, and it forms progressively larger bodies. So they just aggregate into larger bodies, and then it moves on to what we call the planetesimals, which are asteroids, essentially. And then after that, once it reaches a certain size, it's called a planetary embryo, which is up to the size of Mars, I believe. And then it continues to grow until it forms the planets of the sizes that we have. Let's talk a bit about your, your uh, study, because there were a few things that really, that really jumped out at me when, when I was reading about it. Well, the first one is, is that you were, you were looking at the origin of so-called volatile elements. Yeah. I was wondering if you, if you could sort of explain what they are and, and why you were so interested in them. So in cosmochemical terms, volatiles are all the elements that condense below a certain temperature. So they evaporate more readily than elements that are not volatile. And it just so happens that a lot of those elements are essential for life, including the six most abundant elements in living organisms are all volatiles. So the goal of my study was to try and find out which part of the solar system and which kinds of materials contributed to the Earth's volatile budget, because that's so important for life as we know it. Zinc plays quite a big role in the study as well. What was the importance of zinc? Yeah, so there's a lot of elements that would have been more important for life than zinc, but some of them, or most of them, don't have enough isotopes or they wouldn't have the necessary conditions for us to be able to analyze and figure out what their nucleosynthetic isotope composition is, or if there even are any nucleosynthetic anomalies. So we decided to look at zinc because it's volatile. It plays a role in life on Earth, even though it's not essential. And it could be used to trace the entire history of Earth's secretion, because some elements would only trace parts of it. And with zinc, we can see everything from the start to finish. So 
it was a, a great choice to, to go forward with that. Yeah, I, there's this, um, when I was reading it, I thought it was almost sort of quite a beautiful way of describing it. You've got like melted and unmelted planetismals. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really, really nice way of describing that. I was wondering if you could ex explain what that's all about. Yeah, so actually, this is something that I try to come up with to make it simpler for people to understand what we were referring to, but we actually refer to them as primitive or chondritic materials or differentiated and achondritic materials. So the primitive materials, which are the unmelted materials, they're essentially a pile of dust and other very small components just stuck together loosely by gravity. And they haven't been melted or modified within these asteroids in four and a half billion years. So this is why we call them primitive. And then the melted asteroids or the differentiated bodies, they usually go through more radioactive decay, which produces heat within the, these planetesimals and causes them to melt. And some of them will even differentiate just like Earth. So it'll have a metal core and then a rocky mantle and crust around that. So the original components or the dust and small other small components that originally formed them aren't there anymore, aren't preserved anymore. What's caused that to happen? For the most part, is radioactive decay. Some of these bodies, when they formed, they had more radioactive nuclides within them, which produces all these excess heat, and then it causes them to melt and differentiate. And the bodies that didn't melt usually formed a bit later once the radioactivity had already decayed substantially where it was even extinct. So there wasn't enough heat to melt those. So does that mean that you prefer the unmelted or preferable for study because, because they're more pure? They will provide different insights that the melted ones can't provide because we can actually see the components, the minerals, the forms then, whilst with the melted ones, everything will you know, have been melted and homogenized to an extent. So they offer different insights, but then the melted ones will offer us insights into how the melting processes occurred and how they differentiate. So it gives you different opportunities to investigate different processes. So what did you find then? What was the sort of ultimate conclusion of your study? Yeah, so we found that even though the melted meteorites probably supplied most of Earth's mass, up to 70%, they only supplied about 10% of the zinc, while the primitive materials, which supplied only 30% of the mass, supplied the other 90% of the zinc. And we think this can be also extended to other volatile elements. So that tells us that primitive materials may be essential, or at least very important, in supplying volatiles to terrestrial planets. So does this sort of help us get closer to the story of how, of how life emerged on Earth. Is it possible for, for a planet like Earth to have formed around the sun with the ingredients already there? Or do those ingredients have, have to be delivered? So this is part of Earth's formation to have this material delivered. We don't know at which point it was delivered. It may have been early on even. So the material needs to be available. So I think if anything, this adds another constraint to what kind of Things need to be available for a planet to form and have enough volatiles for life to emerge. And it's something that people don't often consider when we're looking for planets that outside of our solar system that could potentially host life. Like, for example, one thing that people also look for is how far is it from its star? Would it be possible for water to be present and at a liquid state at the surface of the planet? And there are many other things that people look at as well. But it's often overlooked whether any material that had volatiles would have been delivered to that planet or was available when that planet formed in the first place. I suppose also, like conversely, if, if you were thinking about our solar system, there would be planets where volatile elements were delivered, but the conditions for life to emerge weren't there. Yeah. So you, you could have it either way, right? If you're thinking about the different planetary system, not our own, you could have planets that had plenty of primitive material available and plenty of volatiles and still didn't have the other conditions for life to emerge. Or you could have systems where you have planets where the conditions would have been met, but there wasn't enough primitive material available during the, that planet's formation. And so the volatiles wouldn't even be available in the first place. 
what do you think that sort of says about about the search for life beyond Earth? That that sort of makes it seem like Earth really could be unique if all those conditions have to be met. Yeah. So as far as what my research says about that, I can't really say how likely it is that other planets would have primitive material available or not, especially outside of our solar system. So that's, I think, to be determined, but it definitely, I think, adds another level of criteria that needs to be met. So it may make things more difficult, but we may come to find actually this is something very common. Most solar systems have enough primitive material available for terrestrial planets to have volatile so i think it's an open question at this point what do you think about say if you take like a, a planet like mars that's relatively similar to earth could you apply your, your research to samples found on mars for example yeah i actually have i'm working on that <laughs> but there's a couple of other papers that have come out with nicosynthetic zinc i still data for mars as well but yeah i don't think i can delve into much detail about that yet do you ever think about it as we sort of Obviously, we've got rovers on Mars. You're able to sort of analyze samples and send us back data. But do, do you ever think about sort of in the future, like humans landing on Mars, we, we could be sending, you know, astrobiologists and geologists to actually do work in the field? Yeah, that would be great. And other planets as well would be very interesting to figure out how unique Earth is, if this is very common within our solar system and try to extrapolate to other planetary systems as well. What about your research? Do you have any sort of follow-ups planned for this particular study or what would you like to look at next? Yeah, so I'm doing zinc for a few more samples, like, for example, Mars, and we'll see what that has to tell us. And do you have other plans as well that I, maybe I can discuss in the future? Well, thanks for coming on the podcast and, and sharing your, your, your study with us. It's a, it's a fascinating topic. And yeah, who knows, maybe we'll speak again in the future when, um, when your next paper's out. But uh, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine, which was edited by Lewis Dobbs. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. 